to work out the procedural rules that will be followed during that debate. This meeting, followed by a brief vote, is an hour and 25 minutes. The Rules Committee will come to order. The Rules Committee meets today for consideration of House Joint Resolution 114 to authorize the use of United States Armed Forces against Iraq. This resolution was introduced by the Speaker of the House along with a minority leader and referred to the Committee on International Relations, which ordered the resolution reported last Thursday. Before I recognize the distinguished chairman and ranking member of the Committee on International Relations, and uh, we review threats to our national security which necessitate this resolution, I would like to comment on certain procedural matters. The decision to authorize the use of force and potentially send American armed forces in harm's way is one of the most difficult decisions any member of Congress can make. I can clearly recall the soul-searching and deliberative process we went through over a decade ago when providing President Bush number 41 with use of force authority. Every member was given time to be heard, and as a result, all options were fully considered and debated in a most serious and public manner. Today's consideration of House Joint Resolution 114 is equally weighty and difficult. That is why we have worked cooperatively with the minority and will ensure that every member will have the opportunity to be heard on the House floor. It's my hope that the rule that this committee will report will provide for considerable debate, and just as was the case in 1991, we will provide a mechanism to ensure that every member has a chance to be heard on this important national security issue. I'd now like to, uh, well, first let me see if uh, my friend Mr. Frost would uh, like to offer any opening remarks before I call on my uh, friends from the International Relations Committee, Mr. Frost. Well, actually, the, chairman, uh, the chairman's statement sounds very much like a statement that I made last week. And uh, I think the important... I use that as the draft on uh, which I, I put my remarks I think together. the important thing here is that, um, uh, that this be a fair procedure, that everyone have the opportunity to be heard, uh, and that we move to a conclusion. And we move to it um, sometime this week, I would gather, from the intention of the majority. Mm -hmm. um, I, my personal belief is that the resolution uh, worked out between the Democratic leader, uh, Mr. Gabhardt, and the President is a good resolution and should be supported by this Congress. There are uh, other members who would like to offer some amendments and some alternatives to that. Certainly we will give careful consideration to all of those, and it's my assumption that uh, at least one alternative will be made in order on the floor, uh, perhaps more. And I think that's all we can ask. I was part of the uh, House in um, 1991 uh, when we voted on this matter before. I voted in favor of the use of force in 1991. Uh, it's unfortunate that we were not able to complete the job at that time. Well, let me just say that I never make assumptions as to what the Rules Committee might do, but uh, I, uh, I do believe that we are going to work again to ensure that every member does have the opportunity to be heard on this issue. Let me welcome the distinguished chairman and uh, the representative from the minority. I guess Mr. Lantos is not here, but Mr. Berman, my fellow Californian who has worked uh, very diligently on this. I know uh, the President of the United States has enjoyed working with uh, Mr. Berman on this, just as Mr. Hyde and I have enjoyed working with Mr. Berman on a wide range of other issues. And so, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for all that you've done to get us to uh, this point where we're dealing with what I said is obviously a very difficult and challenging issue. And let me say that without objection, your prepared remarks will appear in the record in their entirety. And we would uh, welcome a summary. Thank you very much, uh, members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Berman and I are here to request a rule on H.J. Res. 114, introduced by Speaker Hastert and Minority Leader Gephardt. The resolution consists of 23 whereas clauses, and Section 1, which is a short title, Section 2 indicates Congress's support for the use of diplomatic efforts by the President, and Section 3 makes it clear that the President is authorized to act unilaterally, if necessary, 
to protect the national security of the United States. The resolution also recognizes the importance of securing the cooperation of the international community, but does not make this a condition precedent to the use of force. This section also provides that the President gives con give Congress notice of the use of such force as soon as feasible, but not later than 48 hours after exercising such authority. Section 3 also keeps intact the War Powers Resolution requirements, and Section 4 further requires the President to submit a report to Congress every 60 days. As you're aware, Mr. Chairman, this language was painstakingly worked out by our leadership on both sides of the aisle. The International Relations Committee held two days of hearings on the issue. The committee ha had two days of markup on the resolution, resisting over a dozen amendments and favorably reporting the resolution to the floor by a vote of 31 to 11. I leave it to the wisdom of the Rules Committee to craft a fair and equitable rule for the consideration of this most important legislation. The Speaker and the Minority Leader may wish to control the general debate time on the floor. If this is not the case, we would recommend for your consideration that our committee control the time and we would yield to other members and committees of interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you indicated, uh, uh, our ranking member, Mr. Lantos, could not be here at this time, and I'd ask unanimous consent for his statement he put in the record. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a prepared statement. Uh, the there are several di different views. There are many different views within uh, uh, the uh, Democratic Caucus on this issue. Uh, uh, some have the view that I that I have that uh, uh, the resolution that was passed out of the International Relations Committee is the right resolution. It's uh, it's a bipartisan resolution, and it gives the president the authority to do what he needs to be done. And ironically, uh, perhaps uh, creates the greatest dynamic in support of trying to find an option if there is one short of uh, regime change by showing a, uh, a united U.S. government position uh, providing the authorization from the U.S. force. We have other Democrats who do not think force should be used. We have another group of folks who uh, reflect uh, the view that we should play out the hand at the Security Council before we make a uh, final decision authorizing the use of force unless the Security Council uh, authorizes that use of force. And I think that view is uh, reflected in, uh, in the Spratt Amendment. Uh, and we have another view that uh, is reflected in the Davis Amendment, which is prepared to authorize the use of force, but wants to create a, a, a narrower focus and a, and a more and a, uh, and a more precise and higher standard. And uh, while I, I favor the amendment, the resolution as it came out of committee, uh, I believe there should be a way to find uh, opportunities both through substitutes and through the motion to recommit to allow these other views to be promoted on the floor and uh, um, and I think uh, ha happy to answer any questions. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Berman. Thanks uh, to you both for your uh, testimony and outlining your position. It's very helpful, Mr. Goss. No questions except gratitude to the seasoned legislators who have brought this important matter forward. Mr. Frost. I mean it. Yes. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I would like to submit for the record the statement of Ranking Member uh, Tom Lantos. It's already been put in the record. Okay. It was done by Mr. Berman. Okay, thank you. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, we have quite a few witnesses. Uh, I, too, would like to thank uh, the two gentlemen for their diligent work on this matter. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Linder. I have no comments other than to say thank you. This is a very difficult issue and a very important issue, and I'm delighted you've been able to come up with something that we can agree on. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Berman. Uh, you said that you would hope more than one substitute would be allowed and a motion to recommit. Did I hear you correctly? I, I, I thought there were 
there are a number of different am about amendments being propo proposed, being, proposed. But it seems to me there are sort of four general views mm -hmm. on the subject. One is the resolution as passed. I'm saying within our caucus. Right. Uh, one is the resolution as passed from committee and as agreed to by the uh, uh, White House and the House leadership. Uh, the second is a view that thinks that force should not be authorized uh, uh, at this time mm -hmm. based on the current evidence before us. A third that says force should be authorized, assuming the Security Council of the UN authorizes force, but if they don't, there should be a second opportunity under expedited procedures for us to revisit the issue. Mm -hmm. That to me is reflected by the Spratt Amendment. And the other view is uh, the view that's reflected by uh, Mr. Davis's amendment that uh, uh, let's authorize the use of force, but focus it on the elimination and disarmament of the weapons of mass destruction, mm -hmm. either with the approval of the Security Council or on a somewhat tighter certification by, uh, and determination by the President of the United States. And that within those four views, there should be an opportunity through the motion to recommit or substitutes for uh, people to voice mm -hmm. uh, and uh, debate this issue. Mr. Chairman, I've got a cold too. I know how you're feeling this afternoon. Uh, but given the importance of this debate and the fact that we're allocating 20 hours to it, I'm sure knowing you, you would not have any objections either if we had a full airing and that many of the substitutes and the motion to recommit were allowed? Not at all. I think it's essential that we have a full uh, comprehensive airing because this is one of the most consequential questions we'll deal with in years to come, four Indeed. years to come. Indeed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I have a statement um, that I'd like to add uh, to the record, and thank you for that. And I want to thank the gentleman. This is a position that none of us really want to be in. We, we didn't create this. It was forced upon us. And I want to congratulate you for your hard work in a bipartisan way to bring to us a, a resolution that um, most of the House can debate openly and freely and, and hopefully agree with a uh, great majority of our votes. Yeah. Um, thank you for uh, the effort that went into that, and we will <clears throat> give great attention to it in the few days ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Price. Mr. McGovern. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I have great respect for both gentlemen, mm -hmm. and I appreciate their views uh, on, on this matter. Um, um, I, have, I have different views uh, uh, as to how we should proceed here, but um, I, I just have three uh, very quick questions, just so I, I want to make sure I'm clear on all this. The, res the underlying resolution uh, that that you brought here today. Uh, does this resolution allow the United States to launch a, a unilateral military attack against Iraq, even in the absence, even in the absence of or contrary to UN Security Council actions? I would say yes. Okay. And it's hard to. It, I just would add, it's hard to understand how it would be contrary to UN Security Council actions, given that we have a veto at the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you, my second question is, uh, given that response, do you believe that, that Iraq is currently the most serious terrorist threat facing the United States? Do I believe that? I believe it is probably the most serious terrorist threat, a threat to national security facing the United States, yes. More than al-Qaeda? Al-Qaeda is a part of the generic threat. Al-Qaeda is diffused through many countries and many locations. It's, an, it's a network. Um, more, more than Iran and Syria? Iran, uh, Iran has... Uh, there's hope for Iran. Uh, the the uh, uh, political climate there is uh, developing. Uh, and... Uh, Deserves watchful waiting. What was the other country? Syria or Syrian Syria. control Lebanon? We don't know of any. Syria has not made war on anybody like uh, Iraq did, uh, moving against Iran and Kuwait and tried to burn every barrel of oil in Kuwait. Uh, that's been Iraq. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, to me, it is the combination 
of forces and and the cumulative total of the evidence plus the prior history that uh, makes this the case to deal with. It's the it's the weapons of mass destruction. It's knowing it's it's my belief that he has more than we know. He always has. We learned it very vividly in 1990. If you went to the CIA in 1990, they would have told you he had a very primitive nuclear weapons program and would not have a nuclear weapon for five to ten years. And the inspectors somewhat serendipitously found when they, when they went there afterwards that, in fact, he was within six months to a year of having a nuclear weapon. I believe he has more than we know. It is his willingness to support terrorism uh, as demonstrated by his past activities. Uh, and there is an additional factor. The message to others of our willingness to stand up and say this is unacceptable, uh, that uh, uh, the combination of these, these two factors, the effort to acquire weapons of mass destruction by a person who has used them in the past, and the support for terrorism, is a, the, dealing with this is a message to the other countries you mentioned uh, that uh, uh, there's a line not to be crossed here. Well, which brings me to kind of my, my last question. I think everybody believes that these UN Security Council resolutions should be enforced and that the UN Security Council should take action. Uh, and indeed, the President and others have said that one of the reasons why we're doing this is to make sure that these UN Security Councils are, in fact, enforced. But it seems to me that we should be acting on, on legislation authorizing war after the fact. Uh, rather than before, the, rather than before, we should, the UN, we should we should we should ask the UN Security Council to take action, which we've done. Uh, and my understanding is that they are moving in that direction, um, because I think acting before a UN Security Council resolution, um, I think kind of undercuts one of the points the president made in his speech, was, which is we want the UN to be more relevant. We want them to actually enforce their resolutions. And I guess my question to you is: Do you believe that every nation? has the right to unilaterally decide it is going to enforce one or more U.N. Security Council resolutions, regardless of what the Council may be working on at the moment. Uh, could I? Yeah. Uh, speak you you answer, answer that. All right. Um, I dare you. I'd be careful about drawing general principles from specific facts. I'm one who, who would not want to draw a general doctrine about preemptive strikes based on the specific circumstances here. And I think it's a mis uh, and I think it's a mistake to draw uh, general principles from the specifics here. It is the sum totality of the situation that causes me very reluctantly to say this is someone we will have to confront sooner or later the costs and human life and damage in damage to civilians in uh, in, a, in an economic sense, both for the United States and for the world, will be less if we confront this regime sooner uh, rather than later. And I don't know that I'd want to draw a lot more general principles than that uh, from, uh, from this particular issue. But I certainly think the most effective way to get the Security Council to agree to do what it needs to do both in the context of inspections and, if necessary, authorization of the use of force uh, for the purposes of disarmament is for the Congress and the White House to speak together saying this is not a divided America. Uh, there, there is dissent, there is disagreement, but that there is a strong consensus in this country that this issue has to be dealt with. And now, Security Council, having heard that, are you prepared to deal with it? In other words, for me, we maximize our chances of getting what's important out of the Security Council by speaking before the Security Council speaks. Well, I, I appreciate your response, and um, I, I just, I, you know, I don't disagree with the goal. I disagree with the process that we're undertaking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. McGovern. Mr. diaz Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also. Uh, would like to thank uh, Mr. Hyde and Mr. Berman uh, for their leadership on this uh, extraordinarily important issue. Um, 
At the time, at the time of the uh, Gulf War, 1991, I remember that it had been reported uh, in the press that the United States intelligence community had had uh, concluded uh, before the war that Saddam was a long way away from a, uh, uh, being able to possess a nuclear weapon. And it was reported then at the time of the war that uh, when uh, finally that was able to be, that situation was able to be uh, inspected, uh, that uh, Saddam's regime was in fact very close to having a uh, nuclear weapon. Since 1998, no inspectors have been able to go in at all. Uh, I would like to ask both of you to uh, uh, discuss if, as it seems very possible, Saddam were to have the nuclear option, a nuclear weapon, what, that, what you see as the effect of that, not only in the region, but as it would affect uh, United States national security generally. Mr. Hyde. Well, I don't know about Saddam Hussein, but I know there are people in the region who, if they could get a nuclear bomb, would use it in a minute. Uh, if they had a nuclear bombs, they would have used them at the World Trade Center, and we'd be mourning three million people instead of 3,000. Saddam Hussein has no reason to develop weapons of mass destruction except for aggressive purposes. And uh, I think it's imperative that we enforce uh, the uh, resolutions of the Security Council, some 16 of them, that have been shredded by uh, Saddam Hussein, or we make it becomes a paper tiger. It goes the way of the League of Nations. Uh, nice draft, nice. Uh, concept, but ineffective and uh, uh, of no help. So uh, I think it would be a very dangerous situation if we wait for him to get the bomb. Uh, people want a smoking gun. Uh, that means the gun's been fired already. And uh, you will get a smoking city if he has nuclear weapons rather than a smoking gun. And we can't we can't trust his good faith. His track record is otherwise. Mr. Berman. I just, there's a great deal of talk. One of the, you know, one of the, the best arguments against this is he will be deterred from using the weapons that he has or that he might acquire. And I look at it differently. First of all, I don't have much, I'm not, I'm not so sure he would be deterred. But what I, what I feel more certain of is if he has a nuclear capability, his potential to deter us and, and others and allies and multilateral efforts becomes tremendously magnified. And once that happens, then you have Saddam Hussein, the hegemon of that entire region of the world with all kinds of consequences that I think are not in our humanity's interests and um, thank you both thank you chairman uh, I really would like to just uh, state to uh, both of these gentlemen here here before us that I appreciate the hard work that they've done I've now read uh, the entire resolution and am supportive of it believe that it's uh, produced what should be a process that uh, members of Congress and the American public can understand it is uh, it has a process that the president must report back to us give us information and i believe at a critical time in this nation's history this is the correct thing to do uh, i applaud the president for uh, working with uh, the congress uh, both republicans and democrats it seems to me have worked well i see mr hastert's name on here and mr gephardt's name which is an indication that it doesn't really get any better than that uh, working from the top down so i'm pleased with uh, the product that I have read in, in its entirety and proud of the way both of you gentlemen have conducted yourself in this endeavor. I yield my time, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, uh, both gentlemen, as they put considerable amount of work on the House uh, standpoint on this resolution, I want to salute them both for uh, the challenge as they have uh, 
work through both uh, the International Relations Committee consultation with uh, uh, the White House to bring about a, a resolution that garners bipartisan support. And I hope uh, as the debate continues uh, over the next several days on the floor, if the Rules Committee grants a rule, that the uh, debate will generate a large amount of bipartisan support so that this country can again uh, speak with one voice uh, on the issue uh, uh, standing behind the president. Uh, look forward to the uh, continued hearing. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We appreciate all the hard work that you've put into this effort and look forward to consideration of this measure on the floor tomorrow morning. Mr. Chairman, may I Mr. very Hyde. briefly commend Mr. Lantos, Mr. Berman, Mr. Ackerman, and certainly Mr. Gephardt for putting country Absolutely. ahead of party. Uh, they have been invaluable. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do, I do want to say Mr. that Berman. I'm not sure that people who disagree with me on this issue have put party ahead of country. They just see it differently than we do. We look forward to an interesting debate on the floor tomorrow. I, I appreciate you making that point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Let me say uh, to uh, the members of the committee, we have, uh, as you can see from the list, uh, many members who uh, hope to testify on this. And next, we're going to call on a, a panel, which is being led by Mr. Davis. And uh, I'm told that the two other members of the panel are not here, so I guess he's rep representing the entire panel. Oh, is Mr. Cardin here? I didn't see. Oh, Mr. Cardin. Didn't see us sitting in the back of the room. Well, we have two-thirds of the panel here. I know that Mr. Menendez was hoping to be here as well. Mr. Davis, please proceed. And uh, without objection, your prepared marks will appear in their entirety in the record, and we'd welcome a summary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm told Mr. Menendez is on, in his way in the building now, so hopefully he'll be joining us before the presentation is concluded. Uh, I am going to err on the side of uh, brevity. And uh, let me start by saying that the resolution does so as well. Uh, the, the resolution is not brief, but it is concise. The resolution that I am offering with Congressman Cardin and Congressman Menendez is an attempt to do exactly what Howard Berman just said before me, which is to provide a more narrow focus and a more precise as well as a higher standard to be met before the use of for force that we authorize can actually take place. This resolution is based on the Biden-Luger proposal that you have probably heard about that was also, has also been supported by uh, Senator Hagel, at least as of last week. And it is also an attempt to try to present to the House a choice that I think ultimately may be closer to where the Senate is, which obviously would have some advantages in terms of reaching a quicker and a stronger consensus as well. Let me highlight the chief differences between the substitute amendment proposed to you is in relation to the um, underlying resolution that was just discussed. The first point is that under the resolution presented by Chairman Hyde and Ranking Member Lantos, we are authorizing the President to use force to enforce Security Council resolutions unrelated to disarmament and the possession of biological or chemical weapons. For example, under that resolution, we would be authorizing the president to use force to enforce the way Saddam Hussein has treated his prisoners of war uh, and his failure to return stolen property to the Kuwaiti government. I do not believe that we as a body, Democrats or Republicans, want to use military force to enforce resolutions to that effect. And I also don't believe that we want to authorize the use of force for what might be a vague or uncertain reason. Because I think by allowing a multitude of reasons to support the use of force, we are depriving the American public of a very clear and concise reason to justify a decision to use force. And I think that is really unforgivable. I think one of the principles we have to abide by here amongst ourselves and among our constituents when we return home is to be as clear and concise as possible as to exactly what we're doing and why we are doing it. 
The second and final point I want to emphasize to you deals with the standard that must be met before force can be used. Like the underlying resolution that passed the committee that was just discussed, this resolution requires the President to first exhaust all diplomatic efforts at the United Nations. Should that uh, not succeed, this resolution says that before the President could use force, he would be obligated to make a formal declaration to Congress that the risk that Iraq poses to our country and our national interest is so grave as to justify military activity. Grave means uh, very likely to cause serious harm to our country. This is a higher standard than the continuing harm that's provided for in the underlying resolution. It is, in fact, the word that the President used in his best pronouncement to date on what he in the president's words it's putting into the resolution a high standard which i believe is an appropriate standard and i know the other sponsors of the amendment will speak for themselves and those constitute the chief differences uh between the resolution before and this one i would just say that I think on this particular debate, it is very important, as Chairman Hyde said, that we have a full debate, an open and honest debate, and we present to the members, and obviously this is a decision you will make at the Rules Committee, some fundamental choices that they are entitled to make. And obviously the choices that we're presenting to you today are in the context of a resolution authorizing force. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Mr. Cardin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank Mr. Davis for bringing forward uh, this uh, substitute and just encourage you to make it in order so we can have a full debate on the floor. I think this is one of the most important debates that we're going to have in this Congress or recent Congresses, and I hope that we will have all the viable options that are made available by your rule. Let me just point out, this substitute has been uh, out there for some time. I think people know what's in this. It does restrict it to enforcing the UN resolutions concerning weapons of mass destruction. It does uh, clearly speak that the President should seek the support of the United Nations and proceed according to that support. It also provides for the protection of our country. So I think it is a very well written and very tightly uh, tied down resolution and I would urge you to make it in order so we can have this debate on the floor. I think it is different than the underlining resolution reported out by the committee and we should be able to debate the differences between this substitute and the underlining resolution. Thank you very much, Mr. Cardin. Mr. Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman I just Let me want just say without objection that your, uh, your statement will appear in the record in its entirety. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, just to make a couple of points, I think that in this issue that we will be debating, the most significant issue that any one of us as members of this House could ever cast a vote on, on war and peace and life and death, that the Rules Committee, hopefully in its wisdom, will give us the greatest opportunity to have options that can bring us together as a Congress and as a people in pursuit of our goal. I think Mr. Davis's and Cardin's uh, substitute does that. It gives us the wherewithal to set the course of events in the debate as well as I think the vote that would gather around the President and send a clear message internationally that our goal is disarmament, how, how that is to be achieved hopefully with an international presence and cooperation, which I think is crucial, and I think the President understood it to be crucial when he went before the United Nations and told them, act or be irrelevant. Now, you cannot go before the United Nations and say, act or be irrelevant, and then say at the simultaneously, but we will do this on our own anyhow. And the consequences, I think, that flow to us as a country by not at least creating all of the efforts to seek such an international cooperation and coalition beyond the specifics of Iraq are enormous. I think that the questions uh, of our ability to continue to keep a coalition together in the context of terrorism is quite significant. I think that the, there is, uh, the President was right when he made the statements that he, that he made at the UN, but he needs to give it an opportunity. I think this resolution both gives him that opportunity to show that we are with him in that regard, still gives him the flexibility to pursue unilateral action if it's necessary after these other efforts have been pursued, 
still leaves us an opportunity to come together in a rather dramatic vote, in a very significant, solidified vote, but at the same token, uh, I think gives us the wherewithal to go to the American people and say, you know, we had, we had an opportunity, we sought the international support, we understand that this is not just a continuing threat, we have many continuing threats to this country, but it is, as the President has said in the past, a grave and growing threat. If that is the nature of the real threat to this country, then that's the one that should be certified to the Congress, and hopefully with that we will be able to get our allies to join together. So this is a very different substitute on very – this is not nuances, it's significant in nature, and I certainly hope the – Thank you very much, Mr. Menendez. Appreciate that. Mr. Linder. Just a general, a general question. Is it your judgment that the current U.N. resolutions with respect to inspections and uh, weapons of mass destruction are insufficient, and you think they need a stronger one? Is that your point? Circumstances have been changing, and as the President has said, he is seeking a new UN uh, Security Council resolution and that will provide for more robust inspections and uh, stronger enforcement. And we certainly hope that the United Nations will provide that additional uh, leverage in order to get the weapons of mass destruction destroyed. So it's your point that the current resolutions with, with respect to inspections and weapons of mass destruction are insufficient? I think they need to be supplemented by another resolution by the United Nations. I think that's the position of the President, and I support the President's position in that regard. Thank you. Mr. Frost. I would like to thank the members for their very thoughtful contribution, and I hope that the House will have an opportunity to vote on their amendment. Uh, I may not vote for their amendment when it reaches the floor, but I think they absolutely should have the right to offer their amendment. Mr. Deswater. I also would like to thank uh, the three gentlemen for their hard work uh, and their uh, obvious uh, interest in this uh, ultimately serious matter. I'd like to ask, if, does, this, does your resolution authorize the President, if, if he finally deems it required to, uh, to use military force, uh, to uh, liberate the Iraqi people? I don't think the amendment specifically states that, but it does provide that the President is expected to develop a plan as to how to keep the peace and how to deal with the Iraqi situation once disarmament has occurred. I'm sorry I haven't had time to read it, so I will, believe me, because it's such a, uh, an, in, uh, an important issue. Uh, the, in the uh, talking points that I have here, it said that the, the resolution authorizes the use of force only for the purpose of uh, 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 dismantling the, uh, the weapons. It's important to emphasize that what this resolution does is very specifically state that we are authorizing the use of force for disarmament. For example, we are not authorizing the President to send military forces to the Mideast to liberate the Kuwait people. That certainly is a byproduct. But the goal here is disarmament. So it's unclear, your resolution? No, the, goal, the amendment is very clear. No, it with, is regard painfully to clear. with regard to the, the question of... Uh, yes, the amendment is very clear, but it does give the President discretion in terms of how to develop the plan as far as liberating the, liberating the Iraqi... Okay, well, I'll be certain to read your amendment. Thank you. Gentlemen, does your, your resolution, uh, following on the same sentence that my colleague read, assume that there are weapons of mass destruction there? That's, that's your, that is your assumption. So what you're authorizing in that case, uh, what do you... I don't necessarily need to get into whether you've got to prove I think it's clear that like Iraq is in that. violation of current UN resolutions. But that's not the question, though, uh, Mr. Cardin. The question is, do you assume that he has weapons of mass destruction? Yes, we assume that he has biological and chemical weapons currently. We're talking about nuclear. Well, we know he has biological and chemical weapons because the United States gave them to him. Yes. Well, but you're, you're assuming that he has nuclear as well? No, no, we're not making any assumptions on nuclear. I think the information that's been made available indicates that he is attempting to acquire that capacity, but I, I think it's far less certain that he has that capacity today. So what your amendment really says, or your uh, substitute, is that uh, you would like to have authorization to go in and do away with the chemical and biological weapons? 
I think the resolution speaks to the fact that we want uh, the uh, Saddam Hussein to adhere to the resolutions of the United Nations that came about as a result of the Gulf War, mm -hmm. uh, and that is to destroy their capacities for weapons of mass destruction. And you do call on the president to seek the new, res the new resolution from the U.N.? We do, as the president has already expressed his intention to do that so. As Representative yeah. Cardin underscored earlier, I think one of the important aspects of this is that we – I'm sorry, Congressman Endo said it – is that we need to act in good faith. Mm -hmm. We have started a process at the United Nations, and it's incumbent upon us for reasons far beyond the Iraqi situation to proceed in good faith. And if that, in fact, does not succeed, this resolution would allow the use of force if the president formally declares that the risk is a grave risk to the country. So there's a step there that the president would have to come back to the Congress and declare that. There is he, not. Yeah, he, he has to come back and declare decision. it, but, but right, once okay. he declares it, he has been given the authority under this resolution to use force. Without <laughs> coming back to the Congress. If I may just clarify, this resolution recognizes that Saddam Hussein is a dangerous person, right. that he is amassing weapons of mass destruction, that it's in the United States' interest to make sure that those weapons are destroyed. It requires the President to seek the approval of the United Nations to proceed and may proceed with use of American force consistent with the U.N. resolution. Absent getting the U.N. resolution for the use of force, he would have to certify to Congress of the grave risk to our country. Thank you very much. Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Yeah, I, first of all, I, I want to thank the, the gentleman for narrowing the focus uh, uh, in their re resolution, which I think, uh, you know, is, is an improvement over the, over the underlying resolution. But, you know, when I, I, you know, when I go home, the questions that my constituents just keep on asking me uh, over and over is, you know, um, if, we want to, if we want the U.N. to act, and uh, if what they read in the paper is correct, that, in fact, the United Nations, you know, is, in fact, moving toward another re resolution, why don't we just give them the opportunity to come up with a new resolution? Why don't we support them in those efforts rather than having Congress you know, voting on resolutions that, you know, threaten, the, threaten unilateral action to, go, to get around the U.N. if somehow we, we don't fully agree with everything the U.N. does. I mean, if we want to give them an opportunity, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't we, shouldn't Congress withhold taking action until that, uh, until that mo moment comes? Why are we authorizing war when, in fact, uh, the U.N. has, we haven't worked out, we haven't worked through all the diplomatic processes? Uh, and I guess that's a, that's a question well, that... There, there are different views here. There's no question there's different views in Congress. I would hope that that resolution or that substitute would also be made in order by the Rules Committee. I think it's important to have a full debate on the floor. I do believe we should go through the United Nations. I think it will be a constructive, more constructive, and less chance for, for force being necessary. I hope that we will get the destruction of weapons of mass destruction. I think that's all of our goals. I believe that the resolution that we're presenting today gives us the best chance to achieve those objectives. You may have a different view on that for coming back to the Congress, and I would hope that that yeah. substitute would also be made in order. I guess my other question is we all want the U.N. resolutions to be uh, enforced, and I think we need to obviously work toward that goal. I mean, that, that's, that's imperative. But I'm trying to figure out, and I've been trying to do my research to figure out uh, where it's written where any single nation uh, can assume the responsibility for enforcing a U.N. resolution. Uh, it seems to me that, um, that there's n nowhere um, is that authority given to any single nation, uh, which to me, uh, you know, I mean, if we, if we want to go to war with Iraq, you know, we can come up with, you know, our reasons why we want to do it. But to say that we, we're going to do it to enforce a U.N. resolution, um, I'm not sure any single nation has the authority under the U.N. charter to be able to do that. I hope you would look at this resolution, because I okay. think it speaks to that. It speaks to the United States using force in one of two circumstances. One, as part of a U.N. effort. The second one, the risk is so grave to our own security that we have the right to protect our people. I think that is the appropriate use of force by a nation. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate your being here and uh, appreciate all the uh, work that you put into this effort. Our next witness is the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Spratt, who I'm told is uh, being joined by Mr. Moran, Mr. Allen, Mr. Snyder, Mr. Price, Mr. Levin, Mr. Matsui, and Mr. Larson. So, Mr. S is Mr. Spratt not here? Mr. Spratt. Mr. Spratt left. 
Oh, I'm sorry. That happens often when people come to the Rules Committee. Sorry. Mr. Chairman. And well, we certainly wish him well, and let me say without objection, his remarks will appear in their entirety in the record. Mr. Frost. Mr. Chairman, before this panel begins, I'd like to insert in the record at this point uh, two statements by our colleague, Alcee Hastings, who could not be here today. Good. Without objection, Mr. Hastings' statements will appear in the record. And please, Mr. Allen, to proceed. And, and Th we'll thank, your thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Spratt, as I said, was taken, uh, felt poorly, as they say, and, uh, and, and stepped out. He may or may not be back, but I appreciate your um, uh, accepting his statement for the record. I also have a statement for the record. Thank you very much. M Mr. Chairman, uh, we are here asking for a substitute resolution to the one that uh, will be on the floor. And to run through the list of names on it, it's uh, Spratt, Allen, Clyburn, Larson of Connecticut, Levin, Matsui, Moran of Virginia, and Price of North Carolina, and uh, Mr. Snyder of Arkansas. Uh, as others have said, there's no more grave decision than sending our men and women uh, in the armed services into harm's way. And we expect and hope for a full-blown debate on more than one um, resolution before the House. There is precedent for having more than one uh, resolution. In January 1991, there were three, vo three votes in the House regarding Iraq. And in April of 1999, the House voted on four resolutions regarding action in Kosovo. So we believe that allowing a vote on on several resolutions would be entirely uh, appropriate and needed. We're asking in particular that uh, Mr. Spratt's resolution uh, in which we join be made in order. This resolution essentially uh, requires a second step. It authorizes the president to use force in conjunction with uh, existing Security Council resolutions or a new Security Council resolution. Um, and as long as we're acting with the UN, uh, then this, this uh, uh, resolution authorizes the president to, to use military force. It does set up a separate procedure if, for any reason, we have to, the president determines that we need to act on a unilateral basis. This, re this uh, resolution requires him to come back to the Congress for a separate vote. But in order to make that vote, as expedited, the terms of the, the second resolution are laid out in the text of this substitute amendment. Uh, all points of order are waived. No amendments are necessary. Debates uh, are, are allowed. Uh, debate would be limited to uh, uh, 20 hours, and the president would be able to call the Congress back into session on, on an expedited basis. What we are trying to do, uh, quite simply, is to deal with the issue that I think many of us feel is the most serious issue. It is the question of whether or not the United States ought to enforce the United Na Nations resolutions on a unilateral basis. And we are saying simply that rather than decide that issue now, we will give the President all of the, all of the authority he needs to uh, move forward in conjunction with the UN. And also a process by which he can come back to the Congress on an extremely expedited basis and get the authority to, uh, to uh, move alone. In doing this, we think that this will strengthen the President's hand with respect to the United Nations because we, it will be, and, and uh, frankly, weaken some opposition uh, in places uh, and among people who are concerned about unilateral action. Uh, because we think it will reflect the congressional commitment to acting in the first instance uh, with our allies and, and with our friends. Uh, we think that uh, the resolution preserves the unilateral option, as I've said, for the president. And I would hope, uh, given the, the uh, breadth of support that we already feel for this resolution, that you would um, allow it to be offered as a substitute. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the premise of this resolution, and I believe the, uh, 
premise held by the vast majority of the Congress is that Iraq poses a real and credible threat to uh, the United States. Uh, there are legitimate questions, though, as to how to best deal with this threat, how to assess it in the context of other elements of the war on terrorism, and our diplomatic objectives in, in the region. The President requested congressional authorization to use appropriate means, including military force, to enforce UN resolutions and to defend against the threat posed by Iraq. The President's proposal has been amended by hortatory language in a positive way. But uh, in my view, and I believe the view of the other offerers of this alternative, it is still uh, unacceptably open-ended. We are being asked as members of Congress to uh, fall into line behind the President to enable him to exert maximum pressure on Iraq and on the United Nations and uh, to uh, uh, push this matter to, to, to resolution. And that's a worthy objective. We indeed want to support uh, the President in, uh, in that effort. Uh, we are not, however, simply bit players in an attempt to apply pressure. We are members of a coordinate branch of government, and I think we need to face up to that. Uh, we are uh, setting policy for this country. And uh, the, uh, uh, the, the up or down vote, any up or down vote on a resolution is admittedly a crude instrument in this respect. But to authorize unilateral preemptory military action months in advance of a fact situation that we're not yet uh, aware of is, I believe, an unacceptably broad delegation of that, uh, of that authority. Hence, what we're proposing here is a second vote in the event the President uh, deems that kind of, of uh, unilateral preemptory action uh, necessary. Uh, I do not believe we should uh, authorize that in advance. Uh, I, I believe we should authorize that to much closer to the time when the proposed use of force uh, would, would occur. Uh, in the meantime, as Mr. Allen has made uh, very, very clear, the, the resolution uh, supports the backing up of, uh, of uh, inspections with uh, whatever force is required to protect the inspectors and to carry them out. And it also authorizes us to uh, uh, do our part in uh, any kind of UN effort to uh, enforce uh, UN resolutions. Uh, this is an attempt to, uh, to refine the resolution, to make it more commensurate with uh, our duty as uh, members of, uh, of, of a coordinate branch of government to uh, shape national policy, to, uh, to determine national policy in ways that uh, are, are not, uh, do not involve simply a wholesale delegation of the ability to, uh, to unilaterally use force to, to the president. Uh, I, I think it's a, a, a resolution that could command uh, the, uh, the assent of uh, a vast majority of the Congress and of, uh, of our fellow citizens, and I hope very much that it will be made in order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, just briefly say I think this is a third uh, qualitatively different approach uh, to dealing with Iraq, and I would hope that it would be made in order. Uh, I'll take advantage of Mr. Spratt not being here. He, he's proving today the uh, downside of playing with grandchildren, even when they're not feeling so well, and he's paying, I think, the price today. But he's one of our senior members on Armed Services Committee, uh, one of the most respected members by both sides in the House, and I would hope that on this very important issue his amendment would be made in order. Thank you. You've all had this experience. My grandchildren were with us for the weekend. One grandchild came sick. Within 12 hours, her daddy was sick. Within six hours, her father was sick. And when they left yesterday morning. Her little brother was getting sick, and my daughter, who's a doctor, said to us, this thing looks like it's got a gestation period of about 12 hours, so you should be next. <laughs> <laughs> Your amendment is in order. You can go. Has my statement been read? Okay, fine. It's not been read. It's been yeah. 
Could I have the leave to read it if I have the energy to get through it? However you see fit. The reason for asking if I could read it is to, uh, it, it's not that complicated, but it'll give me an opportunity to just lay out the mechanics of it. If the gentleman could deal for just 30 seconds. I'm going to have to go to a leadership meeting in just a couple of minutes. I beg your pardon. And, yeah. no, and, I, and I just wanted to thank the gentleman and the members of this panel for the very <laughs> constructive approach they've taken. Uh, again, I, I don't, this is a close call. I don't know that I would vote for, the, for their resolution on the floor, but it clearly needs to be made in order by this committee, and the House needs to have the opportunity to vote on their resolution. Oh, thanks, Joe. The War Powers resolution that the White House has sent us is a decided improvement over the original draft, but it could be better. If the amendment I'm offering is adopted, I believe the resolution could attract even more votes and pass by a large bipartisan majority. During the negotiation of the War Powers Resolution, Ike Skelton and I supplied Dick Gephardt with several suggestions, including an alternative resolution. Some of what we proposed made the final draft, some did not, and some was changed considerably. As the negotiations were nearing a close, I saved a few of the ideas left over for the draft of a different and new resolution. This resolution supports the President's campaign and the Security Council for beefed up arms inspections backed by force. In fact, it authorizes the use of our armed forces to do just that, stand behind the weapons inspectors. In this respect, it supports the idea of coercive inspections advanced by General Charles Boyd, United States Air Force retired. This resolution also authorizes the use of our armed forces if the Iraqis stiff the inspectors and the United Nations Security Council decides to reply with military force. In this situation, the resolution authorizes President Bush to use the armed forces of the United States, much as his father did in the Persian Gulf War, in a military action sanctioned by the Security Council. If, on the other hand, the Iraqis defy the inspectors and the Security Council fails to respond with force, the U.S. may be faced with going it alone. In these dramatically different circumstances, this resolution calls for a second vote by Congress to approve a military attack, but it ensures the President a fast track for consideration. As I shopped different ideas among members, this one drew the most support, particularly among members like those seated around me here at the desk. Those of us supporting this amendment see Saddam Hussein as a tyrant, and his regime, his regime is a menace to our security. We agree with the President in telling the United Nations that the Security Council should enforce this resolutions and allow no quarter. The Security Council should compel Iraq to destroy its weapons of mass destruction and its means of producing these weapons, and if armed force is necessary, it should use armed force. For several reasons, however, we do not want to see the U.S. act alone unless there's no other choice. Strategically, instead of being the United Nations versus Iraq, and a war legitimated by the U.N. Charter, this war will be the U.S. versus Iraq, and in some quarters, the U.S. versus Muslims and Arabs. This is why General Hoare, former commander of CENTCOM, told us, I fear that, we have to, that if we go it alone, we will pay a terrible price. Tactically, if a war for Iraq has the sanction of the Security Council, it will be easier to build a broad-based coalition, and particularly an alliance of contiguous countries like Saudi Arabia and Turkey, and these countries, with these countries as, as allies and their ports and their landing fields and their other facilities, the fight will be far easier. Financially, we haven't talked much about the budget, but I think it's pertinent. Financially, it will help us to have allies share the cost of this mission, as they did in 1991, when they absorb some 90 percent of the cost of the war. And it'll be even more useful to have their participation in a post-war occupation which promises to be long and expensive. At the moment, the administration's objective is a new and tougher resolution of the Security Council to disarm Iraq through inspections if they work, but through armed force if it's necessary. Our resolution fully supports that objective. But if arms inspections fail, the Security Council does not pass a resolution calling for armed force against Iraq, the circumstances will be materially different. And there should be, should be, a second vote, a separate vote on military action. A second vote is not an imposition on the President's powers. It's the age-old system of checks and balances. And one of the ways, albeit cumbersome, that Congress can say that we prefer for any action against Iraq to have the sanction of the Security Council and the support <coughs> of a broad-based coalition. As a practical matter, further action of the Congress is unlikely to be needed. 
The British seem bent on securing approval of the Security Council before going to war with Iraq. The French have insisted on a second vote before military action begins after Saddam Hussein bucks the arms inspectors, as he almost certainly will. One way or the other, a Security Council resolution seems likely, and once it passes, our resolution authorizes the President to use the armed forces of the United States to enforce it without further action of the Congress. Since early September, when action against Iraq began to appear likely, we've spoken with and heard testimony from retired general officers like Wes Clark, former SACUR, General Hoare, General Zenny, former commanders of CENTCOM, with weapons inspectors, Iraqi defectors, and a host of others. Each has brought a different perspective, but virtually everything, everyone has agreed on two things. One, in any conceivable military confrontation with Iraq, with or without allies, the United States will win. But having allies, especially in the region, like Turkey and Saudi Arabia, will make victory more certain and less costly in money, and most important, less costly in American lives. Number two, Far less certain is the outcome after the conflict, but surely we do not want to win the war only to lose the peace and swell the ranks of terrorists who hate us. International support will raise the chances of success even more in a post-war period. Our resolution makes clear that the United States is prepared to use force to back up arms inspectors and to even use greater force to disarm a recalcitrant Iraq if the action is sanctioned by the Security Council. If Saddam balks at unfettered inspections and the Security Council fails to take action, our resolution clears the way for quick approval of unilateral force. If the Security Council does not act, our resolution loses no doubt that Congress will act, and it assures the President that he can count on Congress to act swiftly. There's also no doubt as to the outcome of any such vote, though by calling for it, Congress conveys our concern that we not go it alone if we can possibly avoid it. Some will say, that this resolution relies too heavily on the Security Council. But, Mr. Chairman, the precedent that follows is the one set by the first President Bush in 1990-91. Within days after Iraq's invasion of Kuwait, President Bush declared that this was about a new world order. He turned to the United Nations and sought the first in a series of Security Council resolutions that culminated in Resolution 678, which authorized the use of force. He obtained all of the Security Council resolutions, including 678, with the evident support of Congress, but without an express war powers resolution until just days before the war began. Rather than asserting that he could act alone, he sought the Security Council approval and allies to stand with us and bear all but a fraction of the cost. The result was a successful military action and a model still worth emulating. Thank you, sir, for your indulgence. Mr. Mr. Spratt has, has explained it so well, I'll, I'll be very brief, not getting too close to him. I missed, <laughs> I, I, I missed my seven grandchildren this weekend, but maybe that was for the best. Um, let me just... Um, emphasize, I think the array of supporters of this resolution, among other thing, things, indicates this is a matter of policy, not patriotism. I think it's clear that Saddam Hussein has to be disarmed of all weapons of mass destruction. I think the chances of accomplishing that are better through collective action. And I think if that doesn't work with a non-use of force, it's more likely to be effective if it's done collectively through the use of force and to avoid some of the downsides that Mr. Spratt has laid out. In a word, I think that what this resolution does is to pressure the UN to act while retaining the power of the president under the Constitution to act in the case of imminent danger, while it also retains the prerogatives of the elected representatives of the House and the Senate. As Mr. Spratt has said, and I deeply believe it, if we want to speak with one voice, and I think that would be far preferable, I think Mr. Spratt and our resolution is the best way to achieve that. Thank you very much, Mr. Larson. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And uh, let me say at the outset how grateful I am for the opportunity to be here and uh, also say how 
humble and modest Mr. Spratt has at every step in this process, uh, he has sought to do something that makes you proud to be part of this institution, and that's to unite us every step of the way. It is clear from every member of this Congress that we are united behind our president and this nation in operation in daring freedom. It is also clear that we are united uh, as a people and proud of our president as he took our case to the United Nations. It is equally true, as everyone has spelled out today, that with respect to Saddam Hussein, we all understand the tyrannical powers that he has exhibited and understand that he is a threat. Where we differ is over process, but it's an important policy difference. And one, as I go back to my community, uh, that I find the divide is as deep as is one that exists between the former Bush administration and the cur current Bush administration, between Democrats in our caucus and Republicans in their caucus. And the divide is over the issue of preemption and unilateralism. And what Mr. Spratt's amendment has attempted to do is to bring us together behind our president in this time of crisis. And as Mr. Allen points out, we believe that our resolution is unique and that it strengthens the hand of the president, which again has been the goal uh, that Mr. Spratt set forward as we worked together uh, to come up with this specific resolution. I can say it no better than our ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Mr. Robert Jordan, who I believe is a great American. Uh, who is uh, former President Bush, Bush's personal attorney. When we asked him over there that whether or not he felt this way, there was a gathering storm here in the Middle East, given unemployment's reaching above 30 percent, median household income dropping from 27,000 to under 8,000, uh, the Wahhabi and other fundamentalists spewing forth hate about the infidel meaning the United States and the current problem that is faced in Israel and Palestine. He said, begging your pardon, Congressman, but you're from New England, and I assume you either read the book or saw the movie. This isn't a gathering storm. This has all the makings of a perfect storm. And so as much as we're concerned about the immediate dangers, we have to be concerned about the collateral risks as well, and the dangers that they present to us. And that's why I believe that this is a, uh, a straightforward resolution that addresses those concerns. And I want to thank the committee. Thank you very much. John, to hear uh, <coughs> resolution, would you interpret your resolution to, to mean that if we move on weapons of mass destruction and Saddam is still in position, that you would not further go for regime change? Would your resolution? prevent that? Both resolutions fuzz up the whole issue of regime change. The assumption now is that if you truly removed all of his weapons of mass destruction, he would be probably deposed. Something would happen to him. Of course, that was the same wishful assumption on which the war ended the last time. But you can read the presence of some. We, we've gotten away from a thing of regime change because uh, it is a lot easier to argue that he has violated a series of Security Council resolutions, and he should be held to account for those. He was he signed a ceasefire agreement, <coughs> agreeing to get rid of all of his weapons of mass destruction and missiles with more than 150 kilometers range. He hasn't done it. He stiffed the inspectors, balked at the inspection, and we should hold him to account for that. Now, what happens to him? In the process of uh, destroying all these weapons, it's hard to say, but, you know, he could easily be one of the casualties in that, uh, in that crossfire. The uh, 1991 event based on United Nations resolutions led our government to conclude that once they had eradicated Saddam Hussein from, from Kuwait, they couldn't go any further. They believed that's all the authority they had. You don't believe, do you? that your resolution would preclude going further? Uh, it, it, no, it's silent on the issue. And basically, when you get right down to that, uh, based on me memory, I think so is the administration. I think you're right.
Thank you very much. It's elliptical. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't have any questions, but I know that, that you are among the most thoughtful members of the House. And I always appreciate your <coughs> wisdom and your hard work. Uh, and I certainly hope that this amendment will be allowed. Uh, I very much fear that, uh, that there will be such a restriction uh, on the allowing of amendments that we really will not have the full discussion that this, this issue deserves. But I certainly uh, add my voice to others on our side that yours, as well as other amendments, substitutes will be allowed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. No questions, but I want to thank all of these gentlemen for their effort. It's uh, extremely well taken and uh, evident that uh, a lot of hard work and thought and concern has gotten into this work, so thank you. I just want to, first of all, I want to, I want to thank all of you for your testimony. I want to particularly thank Mr. Spratt for all of his work. Uh, on this resolution. Uh, I wish this was the resolution uh, that resulted from the meeting with the Republican and Democratic leaders at the White House. I mean, I, I do think this is a resolution that uh, almost everybody can support, uh, if not everybody. Um, I think it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a resolution that is thoughtful, that is reasonable, that is careful, um, and that will, would be effective uh, if, in fact, this is the way we, we, we decided to go. I think it also understands uh, the importance of building an international consensus, of, of working with other nations. You know, I, I get frustrated when I hear some kind of downplay the importance of that, but it, but it is a big deal. Uh, and, and, you know, if we ever, uh, if, it, if it ends up that we, we need to use force uh, uh, in Iraq, uh, it seems to me that uh, it's better not to go it alone. It's better to have uh, the world community with us. Uh, not only in terms of kind of enforcing these UN resolutions, but also in paying this incredible cost uh, of going to war in Iraq and ultimately paying the cost of rebuilding Iraq, uh, which is a phenomenal, uh, uh, phenomenally high amount of money that uh, if we don't have international support that we're going to have to uh, deal with all alone. Um, I also think what, what uh, the gentleman from Connecticut raised, this issue of kind of collateral consequences of going alone I think it's also an important uh, issue. I mean, I, you know, we have international support in our war against terrorism. We have people all over the world, countries all over the world, supporting us in our effort to, to crack down on these al-Qaeda terrorists. Um, the question is, how much more difficult does it become for some of those countries to cooperate with us if we are acting alone in Iraq uh, without uh, international consensus? Um, and those are questions, I think, that, uh, that need to be raised, that we need answers for. Uh, but I think uh, it's, 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 it's a very serious matter. So I, I, you know, I can support your resolution. I think it's, it's the right way to go. It's a th it's, it's the, I think it's the most effective way to go. And uh, I, I hope that not only will you have an opportunity to offer it, I hope that this is the resolution that this body actually embraces uh, at the end of the day. So I thank you very much for your efforts. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. We thank appreciate you. your thoughtful thank remarks you. and all of your hard work. Sorry, guys. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> Let me get out of the range. Absolutely, we appreciate that. Our final witness is the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. And please uh, come forward and, uh, without objection, any prepared remarks that you have will appear in the record in their entirety, and we would welcome a summary. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'll be relatively brief. I think there is. Uh, Mr. McGovern and others have alluded to it, a common wisdom of Americans to understand the advisability of obtaining a, a multinational, multilateral approach to Iraq. And basically, the amendment, the approach I have adopted is following the template of the first uh, President Bush uh, in the Persian Gulf conflict in the last decade, who essentially, before coming to Congress, went to the world community and over several months of very uh, intense negotiating, developed a, a broad-based international coalition and then went to the United Nations and did obtain uh, a United Nations authorization for use of military force to eject uh, Saddam Hussein for Kuwait, then came to the U.S. Congress. And the, the position I had proposed essentially would follow that template uh, almost to the T. Uh, but I want to tell you that I'm going to withdraw my amendment in favor of, uh, uh, in the hopes that this committee will allow Mr. Spratt's amendment to come to the fore for consideration. And I do so because I think it, it uh, is a good embodiment of some of the thinking of large members of both caucuses. And I think that will help the American uh, people to understand the real nature of the debate 
And I would urge you to allow the Spratt Amendment for consideration and thank you for uh, your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Inslee. We appreciate that. That concludes the, uh, the hearing on H.J. Res. 114. And let me uh, announce to members I've been in consultation with Mr. Frost, and we are working with the minority, as uh, everyone knows, to fashion uh, a rule which will allow for a full airing of uh, these issues so that every member will have the opportunity to be heard on this. Um, the final touches are being put on that, and it's my hope that we will reconvene uh, before we go into our series of votes, which are scheduled for 6.30. So we'd reconvene about uh, 6.15 or 6.20. So with that, the uh, committee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair. The Rules Committee will reconvene. We are uh, going to proceed with uh, marking up the rule on H.J. Res. 114. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frost. Uh, I ask that the statement by uh, uh, Ms. Jackson Lee uh, be inserted in the record. At Without the objection, Ms. Jackson Lee's statement will be uh, placed in the record uh, before the conclusion of the uh, hearing. And now as we uh, proceed with the markup, the chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Goss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.J. Rest 114, authorization for the use of military force against Iraq, resolution of 2002, a structured rule. The rule provides for 17 hours of debate in the House equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Committee on International Relations. The rule provides that it shall be in order for the majority leader or his designee after consultation with the minority leader to move to extend debate on the joint resolution and that such motions shall not be subject to debate or amendment. The rule waives all points of order against consideration of the joint resolution. The rule provides that the amendment to the preamble and the amendment to the text recommended by the Committee on International Relations now printed in the joint resolution shall be considered as adopted. The rule makes an order only those amendments printed in the Rules Committee report accompanying the resolution. The rule provides that each amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, and shall be debatable for the time specified in the report equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent. The rule weighs all points of order against such amendments. The rule provides for one final hour of debate on the joint resolution as amended, equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Committee on International Relations after the consideration of the amendments. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. And finally, the rule provides that during consideration of HJRS 114, the chair may postpone further consideration of the joint resolution to a time designated by the speaker, either on the same legislative day or on the next legislative day. You've so heard the motion of the uh, gentleman from Sanibel. Let me uh, just say that, uh, as it was outlined, uh, we will have, including the one hour of debate on the rule, a total of 21 hours. But obviously, uh, it is uh, in order if uh, there is a desire to, uh, under unanimous consent, extend the uh, debate, that will clearly be possible. As it says, there's 17 hours um, of debate initially. There is a closing hour of debate, which would bring it to 18 hours. And then, in making order the Lee substitute, there will be an hour for that. And in making order the Spratt substitute, there will be an hour for that, that bringing it to 20 hours. And then, as I uh, said, the debate on the rule, which would mean that uh, basically we will have 21 hours, and it's our plan to begin uh, first thing tomorrow morning uh, on this process. Are there any amendments? Mr. Chair Frost. Chairman, I move the committee make in order uh, the amendment number 10 by Representative Davis of Florida and I ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The amendment would narrow the trigger for using military force to weapons of mass destruction, emphasize the importance of international support and the UN Security Council, 
by encouraging the President to exhaust diplomatic efforts at the U.N., while reserving the right to act unilaterally if the U.N. does not approve a new resolution in a timely fashion, and raising the risk assessment from continuing to grave. The amendment is identical to the Biden-Luger proposal under debate in the Senate. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the Frost Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. And paying the chair the noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Mr. Chair Frost. Chairman, I have an an end block amendment to the rule. I move that the committee make and order the following amendments. Sherman number one. I'll accept it. Are you going to offer the committee? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, 17 three. Uh, Wynn number five. Udall of Colorado number eight. Rush number nine. Uh, Jackson Lee number 13. Schakowsky number 14. And Jackson Lee number 19. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the Frost Amendment. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. And the pay the chair, the noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mrs. Slaughter. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I move the committee make an order the amendment number 17 by Representative Hastings of Florida and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The amendment would authorize the president to use military force to defend U.S. interests against a threat posed by Iraq contingent on the president meeting certain <coughs> specified conditions. You've heard the uh, motion of the uh, gentlewoman from Rochester. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the slaughter amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed, no. Pay the chair. The noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move the committee make and order the amendment number three by Representative Hastings of Florida and ask that the amendment be given the appropriate waivers. The amendment would amend the bill to require the president to provide Congress with a plan for the long-term cultural, long cultural, economic, and political stabilization in a free Iraq, including estimates on the cost the time and the number of U.S. and allied forces that will be required to achieve that stabilization. You've heard the motion of the gentlewoman from New York. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the slaughter amendment. Those in favor will say aye. Those aye. opposed, no. The no. chair of the noes have it. The noes have it. The motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? If not, the vote occurs on the motion of the gentleman from Sanibel. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. Opinion chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. And I'm about to say something that I have not said for the entire 107th Congress to the encouragement of a lot of the members here. I will be managing my first rule of the 107th Congress tomorrow morning for the majority, and, and Mr. Frost managing. will be managing it for the minority, as he has told me. Let me just say that um, thank you all very much for, uh, for coming in and for helping us move through this process. As we've all said throughout the hearing, this is a, a very difficult and weighty decision that we all face, and I believe that we have in place a structure that will allow for a very rigorous and challenging debate, and then, as has been said by virtually everyone, it's our hope that we'll all be together at the end of the day. So with that, the committee stands adjourned. Tomorrow, the House of Representatives begins debate on the resolution authorizing the use of military force against Iraq. You can see live coverage of that starting at 10 a.m. Eastern here on C-SPAN.